Growing as a Christian means deepening our relationship with God, which we do by getting to know Jesus more and more. But when we meditate on who Jesus is, we are immediately confronted by our own inadequacy. Next to the holiness of God, what do I do with the sin that remains in me even after I'm saved? In this video, we're going to discuss the topic of sin and repentance with the help of chapter 2 of Deeper by Dane Ortland. This chapter is called Despair. By calling this chapter Despair, Ortland is trying to help us see that it is a healthy necessity for a Christian to have self-despair. He writes on page 38, Fallen human beings enter into joy only through the door of despair. Fullness can only be had through emptiness. This happens decisively at conversion as we confess our hopelessly sinful predicament for the first time and collapse into the arms of Jesus, and then remains an ongoing rhythm throughout the Christian life. So we're not talking about despair as an emotion right now. We're talking about despair as having no doubts that everything in our lives depends on the grace of God. It's coming to the end of yourself, because when you gaze at the perfection of God, you see all of your own imperfections and limitations. Ortland calls it the supreme contrast, when we have such a big view of God that we see how small and sinful we are. Now, we're not saying that the primary identity of Christians is sinner. No, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No matter what indwelling sin remains in us, believers are in Christ. And so the next chapters of the book will explore what that means. But what we are saying now is that Christians cannot grow themselves. We cannot grow as Christians if we have naive pride about our own spiritual abilities or maturity. Now, sure, you might be quick to admit that you're not perfect, that you still sin, but how often have you tried to cling to your spiritual independence? Most of us don't like to ask for help, especially when it comes to spiritual things. We subtly think, Jesus, thank you for getting me out of the pit and getting me into heaven, but while I'm still living, I've mostly got this. I think I can do this whole following Jesus thing, maybe, maybe with a little help from you. Now, we never say that out loud, but many of us have locked God out of certain areas of our lives. Let me ask you this. Why do you sometimes go an entire day without praying or even thinking much at all about God? It's because a part of us still believes that we can live life on our own strength. Ortland writes, Christian growth is, among other things, growing in sensing just how impoverished and powerless we are in our own strength. That is, just how hollow and futile our efforts to grow spiritually are on our own steam. Later, he puts it even more strongly, you cannot feel the weight of your sinfulness strongly enough. So I want you to hear this warning clearly. You cannot grow very much in your relationship with Jesus if you will not let yourself be humbled continually. Morality, if it doesn't have deep humility, is just as dangerous to your faith as immorality. Jesus said that whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for Jesus' sake will find it. Death is the great prerequisite to life. So if you feel stuck in your Christian walk, if you feel defeated by old sin patterns, if you've given up hope for being or becoming holier and wiser, if your discipleship journey with Jesus just feels boring, then let that emptiness take you down. Come again to Jesus, poor in spirit, asking for forgiveness for your arrogance. And the gentle and lowly Jesus, who emptied himself to give you life and life abundantly, he promises to meet you and to give you more and more grace. I had a mentor once who said that every person who wants to grow in their faith needs to walk through three rooms. You can think of them as steps along the path to Christian maturity. He called the first room the Goodwill Hunting Room. If you haven't seen the movie Goodwill Hunting, you should definitely watch it. 
maybe not with your kids in the room. A lot of swear words. The movie is about a troubled young man, Will, who's played by Matt Damon, who needs to see a therapist, Sean, played by Robin Williams. At the end of the movie, Will reveals to Sean that he was abused as a kid by his foster father. And Sean comes up to him and says, Will, it's not your fault. And Will tries to brush it off at first. He says, I know, I know. But Sean keeps repeating it. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And Will starts to get angry. He says, look, man, what are you doing to me? Stop messing with me. Over and over again, Sean repeats, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. Until Will finally breaks down in tears, finally able to grieve the things that happened to him as a kid. In the same way, all of us have experienced pain and suffering that was done to us even though we were innocent. And we need to get to a place where we can grieve these things and say, it wasn't my fault. We won't grow very much if we can't face our wounds and bring them to the healer. That's the first room. But then we have to walk into the second room, which is the dark room. This is where we have to face the things that are our fault, the wrongs we've done, the people we've hurt, the secrets and the lies. That is what this chapter is about, repenting from our sinful selves and by faith running to the cross again and again for forgiveness. Ortland calls it the painful corridor of honesty about who we really are. Only when we've dealt with the things that are not our fault, and the things that are our fault, can we come to the third room, the light room. This is walking in the light, feeling near to God, full of joy and peace, thriving and flourishing in our faith. The point is this, we are not meant to stay in the pit of despair. We need to go there to experience it and to humble ourselves. But when we kneel in the dirt, before the Lord Jesus. He doesn't keep us there. He picks us up, he dusts us off, and he walks with us. The chapters that follow will describe more of what the light room looks like, what it looks like to live in the light. But before then, we need to stay in the dark room for just a little while longer with the spiritual discipline of confession. For those of you who come from a Roman Catholic background, the word confession might evoke images of the booth and the priest, but that's not what I'm talking about. The practice of confession is an intentional surrender of my specific sins to the forgiving love of God, along with the expression of a desire for God to change me. So it's two things. We ask God for forgiveness and we ask God for change. Confession is close examination, not in order to feel shame, but so that within the safety of God's love and forgiveness, we can find transformation. It's saying, Lord, I want to be closer and nearer to you, so remove any obstacles that I have put in the way of our relationship. And then, purify my heart anew, so that over time, slowly but surely, I look more and more like Jesus. What we're acknowledging in confession is the distinction between justification and sanctification. Christians are justified, declared to be righteous in the sight of God immediately when we are saved. But Christians are sanctified progressively. Christians are going to sin until the day we die and are resurrected in glory, So we still have need to confess our sins daily. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 1, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The point is that making confession a regular spiritual discipline in your life is an excellent way to remember and process this idea of self-despair. I've put some resources in the notes below that can help you to ponder this topic, but here are some first steps for practicing the spiritual discipline of confession. First, ask God to help you see yourself as he sees you. 
This means both that you would know deep in your soul how much he loves you, and also that he would show you the areas in which you need to be transformed. Now, this can be a difficult thing to ask, but it's necessary because God is the one who knows your heart best. He made you, after all. This is the basic idea of Psalm 139, and the last verses of the psalm are a good place to start. David wrote, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I've also found it helpful to pray written prayers of confession, and I've put some below from the Book of Common Prayer and some other prayer books to help you as you bring this request to God. Second, intentionally confess specific sins. Now, usually our confessions of sin are general, and there's a place for that. Something like, Lord, forgive my sinful pride. But there is also a place for us to study our sin patterns in order to kill them. So, for a time, try to add details to your confessions to God. Lord, forgive the words I spoke to my spouse in the car yesterday. Father, I repent of my unrighteous anger during that two o'clock meeting. Lord, I did not give generously to this friend, even though I felt you prompting me to do so yesterday. Now, as you do this, you will notice patterns, and this is how God shows you where you need to be transformed. You might even consider keeping a a most wanted list journal where you write down your most wanted sins, the sins you want God to change in you the most. So you write down the date and what sin you've confessed. Now, this is not meant to be a record of blame or condemnation. This is a strategy to move sin from vague and kind of out there to the specific areas in which you want God to sanctify you. Third, confess not only to God, but also to others. The scriptures make it clear that repentance and forgiveness have a horizontal dimension as well as a vertical. Our sin affects others, and so we must confess to the people we've wronged as well as God. And we need to do so with specificity. We need to say, my friend, I'm so sorry for the joke that I made yesterday. It was inappropriate, and I can see that it made you feel really uncomfortable. Now, doing this communicates that you take sin seriously, even if the other person might not. They might brush it off and say, oh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. But your part is simply to come to them and say, no, I've sinned against you, and I'm so sorry. Jesus is changing me slowly. And I want to improve and get better. Now, if you make this a habit with your spouse, with your kids, with your friends, your coworkers, even with strangers that you've wronged, it will be awkward at first, but it will also show them that you want to grow in your discipleship. As we come to the end of this video, take a moment and answer this question. What are specific sins that I must confess to God right now? What are the areas in my life in which I feel like, I've got this on my own, I don't really need God here? What is preventing you from walking into the goodwill hunting room, where it's not your fault, and you reckon with the things that were done to you? And then, what is keeping you from walking into the dark room? What might happen in your life if you made confession of sin a regular practice and discipline? As usual, I'm going to close this video by praying for you. Will you pray with me right now? Father, David prayed that you would create in him a clean heart and renew a right spirit within him. We pray the same for ourselves. Help us to see ourselves like you see us, as your children whom you love, and as your disciples whom you want to transform. Jesus, thank you for your forgiveness. We long for the day when we need to despair no more because you will make all things new. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.